This is the first um, ASAP Explorative Symposium, and we're going for a ride here, and we're, we're really glad you're, you're joining us for this. Um, we ask that you, um, throughout the day, speak loudly and clearly and slowly. We are recording a, a, a good part of the afternoon, and we'd uh, like to have that so we can actually understand what we're saying. So I'll try to practice what I'm requesting of you all. Uh, I'd like to um, introduce our keynote speaker for today. Sarah Houston gets the prize for traveling the farthest. She flew in from London on, on Wednesday night. And she was also one of the first to sign on to uh, join us in the symposium. And um, I have a feeling she did know exactly what she was getting herself into when she agreed to it. But she, she jumped in with great enthusiasm, and we're really grateful that she has. In addition to being a university lecturer and a trained dancer and choreographer, Sarah has conducted studies looking at dance within a number of community settings. But it's her work specifically with Parkinson's disease and with the English National Ballet that caught our attention. I first met Sarah almost two years ago at a, a uh, Dance for PD workshop at the Mark Morris Dance Group um, Center in Brooklyn. <laughs> And although it was a very brief meeting, she has um, since then become a really valuable resource for our team. So I want to thank you in advance for that. Um, we're really excited to have Sarah here today. Um, and I'll now let her tell you about some of the work she has been, is doing, and some of her interesting um, ideas for the future. Sarah? Thank you, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me? Is this a little bit, little bit louder? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> and thank you for your nice welcome um, to me, uh, Rachel. Rats Can't Dance Challenges to Researching Dance for People with Parkinson's Disease. One of my research participants is a passionate advocate for dance as well as being an academic. Ray has Parkinson's disease. In a book of his life with Parkinson's, he related a story, which I'd like to tell you. He was wondering how dance compared to other forms of exercise. He writes in his book, I asked this question of a newly appointed director of a Parkinson's disease research center after he gave a research seminar in which he extolled the virtues of exercise, such as running. He thought carefully and said he could see no reason why it should not be of equivalent benefit, but it would be difficult to prove one way or another. Puzzled, I inquired why, and he replied, because rats, we cannot teach rats, sorry, because we cannot teach rats to dance. Dance was beyond the reach of science for this particular director. <laughs> the story caused me to think carefully about whether or why my research may be important. My current investigation I'm directing examines the experience of people with Parkinson's dancing. The research is a mixed method study over four years using biomechanical and sociological ways of researching partly to triangulate data, and partly to extend further the typical methods of inquiry in this field. My specific role as a dance scholar is to document people's experiences in an eth from an ethnographic perspective, and to use grounded theory to understand people's responses to dancing to understand the relationship between the materially degenerating body and the person creating movement within time and space, to understand why dancing might matter, and what contributions to movement as an artistic medium are gained from studying the Parkinsonian way of moving. On the one hand, Ray's story caused me to think about what type, what my type of research gives to the understanding of dance and of Parkinson's that other types of research may find more challenging to unearth. On the other hand, why should research, which is not about proving anything, or in particular, 
proving whether something cures someone be of any value when the area of study involves an as yet incurable disease? Is there an ethical dilemma here? I would like to pose a few ideas in relation to some of these questions this afternoon. We are here as artists and scientists, scholars, musicians, dancers, poets and actors. We come with a mutual interest in socially engaged arts practice, in furthering understanding of the arts, of sciences and of people. We come to build bridges and develop partnerships. In nourishing the seeds of fruitful collaboration, it is useful to reflect on the provenance of how we research and why. And for artists to reflect on why we want research and the value of it for arts practice or participants. This afternoon I would like to contribute to this by talking a little about community art and in particular dance, my specialist area, in relation to possible benefits for participants. To highlight why we might consider outcomes we cannot measure as well as that which we can and how we might be able to do without the rats. <coughs> Let's get back to the problem of teaching rats to dance. I suspect the director of research was thinking about possible and potentially useful studies altering the biochemical state of rat brains in order to prove dance's effect on these states. Unfortunately for him and for us, it is difficult to conceive of how we might could organize rats in such a way as to teach them to dance, to encourage them to use imagination to create movement patterns and relations that embody a sense of rhythmic playfulness or strategies. Actually, the definition of dance is far from set, as is the case for many art forms. The history of dance and other arts has been created by artists seeking to question previous traditions of art making and philosophers have been in disagreement as to what the essential elements are of art or dance are since the ancient Greeks, if there are any essential elements in the first place. General claims of definition, therefore, are far from obvious. Perhaps that director of research was right to be wary. Art is not straightforward. Perhaps philosophical debate doesn't matter for participatory art too much, although I think it might. Within research it is easy just to focus on the Parkinson's and use the dance merely as a tool or mechanism, like a treadmill or bench press, to facilitate physical exercise, to forget that it is complicated. Like other forms of art, dance is a living mutating, vibrant umbrella term for a whole host of activities that may be wildly different in terms of, for example, aerobic and anaerobic output, adherence to rhythm or technical movement, or how it is taught uh, or why it is done. Art is not straightforward because it resists clear-cut conclusions, preferring to co provoke questions instead of answers. Art involves abstraction from the literal. It involves flights of imagination and knowledge of cultural context. Its rules and ways of doing things do not stand still, but develop in the hands of different artists and participants. It is about stories, interpretation and relationships. Given the layers and nuance found in artistic activity and products, it is no wonder that many scientists have shuddered to tackle the outcomes claimed for participating in the arts. Explicit answers and clarity of out outcomes will be harder to obtain if examining a practice that deliberately values opaqueness and which works from an, uh, an interpretative stance. Although, some would argue, it is precisely the divergence from the literal, thinking in different and creative ways, that makes an inspirational scientist. Despite these difficulties, dance has been used in studies and there has been a confidence that it can be used alongside other physical activities to measure impact on balance, fitness and mobility, for example. 
particularly using some evidence-based approaches and numerical data, researchers have attempted to lay groundwork in exploring the physical side of dance to help those with incurable conditions. In addition, although sometimes less confidently, many artists having to write applications to funders have had to attempt to indicate the instrumental benefits of their projects, usually by, by citing positive comments by participants noted during or at the end of the project. Fortunately for artists of the future, the academic literature on the outcomes of participating in the arts are, is starting to grow. And researchers have been canny. For example, using pharmacological language to appropriate dance in a so-called health context as a non-pharmacological drug, <laughs> complete with suggestions on optimum dosage. <laughs> Along with clinical scales, numerical questionnaires, MRI scans and electromagnetic sensors, pharmacological language has had the effect of making dance more respectable, yeah. more media friendly, less messy, less fuzzy, less non-scientific. The effect of using scientific language and procedures to accommodate dance is that it distills the art form down to specific outputs and outcomes. There seems to be clarity in talking about dance, for example, as a physical intervention to help balance, or in closing down the focus on dance as a tool to aid mobility. The benefits, or not, are at the forefront of capturing what might be important to help alleviate symptoms of disease, always, of course, taking into account the limitations of studies. Qualitative work, like my own, aims to open up the subject rather than reduce the focus. Analysis is not pared down to numbers to look at efficacy, but prizes are part layers with, within description to interpret or make sense of the multi-dimensional nature of the experience in question. In addition, a qualitative methodology will prioritise examining the meanings people attach to phenomena rather than concentrating on, for example, disease. Like the art forms in which these research subjects take part, such research embraces the messiness and ambiguity that people bring and acknowledges the jostling priorities and agendas at play in the situation in question. The two broad approaches, I believe, can be complementary rather than antagonistic. They may address usefully a range of points, as expansion and reduction can provide much more comprehensive data together about a phenomenon than they can separately. For example, observations that are noted but cannot be dealt with in the specific parameters of a quantitative assessment can be taken up by an additional qualitative study. Points and issues taken from an ethnography which may have been necessarily ignored by a statistical survey on the same participants, may be of interest in the analysis of results. Ideas from experimental results can be checked out in the natural setting, and ideas from qualitative studies can be verified within exp an experimental environment. Each approach helps to check some of the other's blind, potential blind spots. Despite tensions between different methodological approaches, the investigation could be more thorough or rich, and triangulation of data can prove, it, can prove productive in backing up conclusions, pointing out anomalies, or extending the analysis further. On its own, or in conjunction with quantitative methods, the addition of an interpretative study leads one beyond benefits to Parkinsonian symptoms to a much broader spectrum of value for the people dancing. This is where research meets the art and the socially engaged artist, where one may be able to investigate the convergence of human relationships with human creativity. The community art dance artist works with a people-centered focus where the individuals engaged in dancing matter as much as the artistic content of the work. 